Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is Great Big History Podcast. This is episode two of China, where we do Confucian philosophy. Confucius lives from 551 to 479 BC. His name is spelled C-O-N-F-U-C-I-U-S. And Confucius is a teacher during a warring states period which means he's an unhappy camper. He's not happy. Why? Because you can't really be a teacher in a warring states period. Why? Because schools are used by the military and students go off to war. There's not a lot of need for learning in a warring states period because the kids are fighting. They're at war. So he dislikes violence. He's a contemporary of Sun Tzu, if I'm not mistaken. And Sun Tzu is a general or at least a, a military uh, consultant, and he does very well. He's got – Sun Tzu's got lots of clients who want to hire him. Meanwhile, Confucius is kind of out of work. So he dislikes violence. Confucius dislikes violence, and he dislikes destruction because, you know, your kids can't go to school if their homes are destroyed, if their city is destroyed, if the teachers are murdered. And so he, he – sees this as a giant disruption of China. And he asks the question, why? Why are, why are we doing this to each other? And the answer he comes up with is an answer that sounds similar to kind of the Republican-Democrat fight right now of, of the United States, is that increasingly you're a partisan. Increasingly, we no longer see each other as Chinese, that we don't see anything in common with each other. And so he asks a question, how do I stop war? How do I create peace? Which is a massive question. People have been asking this from the beginning of time. And his answer comes out to be ethics and social responsibility. He's going to write about ethics and social responsibility. And he's going to come up with the idea that your position equals your responsibility plus your obligations. So what does that mean? Well, let's take you. Just you. Everybody has something in common. Everybody has something in common. What do they have in common? They have parents. They have a mom and a dad. You have to have them. We, we reproduce. Humans reproduce sexually. So you have to have a mom and a dad. And so that's what you got. Now, that doesn't mean you have relationships with them. And that's what we're going to talk about in a moment. But everyone's got one of each. And so now the idea is, well, now you're a child, you're a son or a daughter. What does that mean? Well, that means you have certain responsibilities to your parents. So let's go with the traditional 1950s um, nuclear family, right? Let's use that as our model because that's our uh, – the extended nuclear family, the extended family is our essentially our model for our, all of history until we start to get in vitro fertilization. So um, so a child has responsibilities to the parent. Those responsibilities are to listen, to follow, to obey. Meanwhile, the parent has responsibilities to the child. They have to take care. They have to nurture. They have to educate. They have to feed. And that's the dynamic. If you have younger brothers or sisters, you have that same dynamic. The older brother has to take care of the younger siblings. And they have to obey the older one. The older sibling's job is basically make sure the younger ones don't die. And the older sibling turns to the younger ones and say, okay, do what I want you to do. Have any of you, if you're older, have any of you ever used your younger brother or sister as a slave? You're there playing video games or watching TV and you're like, hey... Younger brother, go get me a Coke. Go get me some chips. Okay. And they run off. So you have these responsibilities. Why do you have the responsibility? Because you're the older brother or you're the older sister. It's just the way it goes being the older sibling. So, and younger siblings have to obey just like they obey their parents. So what happens? Sooner or later, 95% of you will get married. Do you have responsibilities to your wife, to your spouse? 
Yes, you have to love, cherish. You say it right there in your vows. You have to do it. Do they have responsibilities to you? Yes, they say it right there in their vows, right? Love, honor, cherish, no longer obey. And so you state, I have responsibilities to you. Why? Because I'm a husband, because I'm a wife. That's why. That's it. Just your new position brings with it new responsibilities. But also with your wife comes her parents and her siblings. And do you have responsibilities to your brother-in-law? Yes. Do you have responsibilities to your mother-in-law? Yes. If you think you don't, you haven't been married. Because you do. Sooner or later, you're going you're gonna to get a call. And you're not going to get a call. Your wife is going to get a call at 3 a.m. because it's raining and the roof is leaking. And she's going to call your wife and say, you have to come over. My roof is leaking. And she, your wife is going to turn to you and get you up. And you're going to find yourself on the roof in the dark uh, with, a, with a hammer in one hand and a flashlight in the other in your PJs and your bunny slippers whacking the the the... The tiles of the ceiling going, I don't know what I'm doing and just whacking things. Meanwhile, your wife and your mother-in-law are going to be downstairs, um, having cocoa, talking about the good for nothing, bro your good for nothing brother-in-law, which you know, your mother-in-law did not call because he's good for nothing and no, everyone knows he wouldn't have shown up. Of course, one day you'll get a call from your good for nothing brother-in-law at around 4.30 in the morning and he'll be like, Hey, bro, because then you'll be bro, bro. Uh, yeah, can you come and bail me out? It seems, you know, I got into an altercation with a cop. It seems like he didn't like the fact I was peeing in public on him. So it's a uh, five grand. Can you come and bail me out? So five grand's a little much. Say a thousand dollars, eight hundred bucks. Are you gonna say no, man? You're my brother-in-law, but you deserve to be in jail. You're good for nothing. It'll serve you right. Is that what you're going to do? No, you're not going to do that. And those of you who say you will, you won't. Why? Because you got to call at 4.30 in the morning. It woke up your wife. So when you try to go to bed, she's going to go, was that my brother? And you're going to say, yes. And she's going to go, is he in jail again? And you're going to say, uh-huh. And she's going to say, are, what are you doing? And you're going to say, oh, I'm going back to sleep because he deserves to have a night in jail. And she's going to say, you're going to leave my little brother, my brother, who I took care of when there was no one else in the world, when our parents weren't around. You're going to leave him in jail for who knows how long, for who knows what to happen. Who do you think you are? You are not the man I married. The man I married would not leave his brother in jail. And you're going to be like, Put it on your slippers. Be like, yes, I'm going to Wawa. Go get some money. Of course you're going to go do it. Even if you think it would be better for him and better for everybody. It doesn't matter because you have responsibilities to your wife. Your wife has responsibilities to her brother. And thus you have responsibilities. Why? Just because you're married. That position. Do you have responsibilities to your sisters? To your sisters. Do you, to your wife's sister's wife? Yes. You have responsibilities to your wife's sister's wife. How do you know? Because it's three o'clock in the afternoon and it's pouring and you get a call. Hey, it's Judith. You know, your wife's sister's wife. Um, my car just broke down. I'm about three, four blocks away. Can you come pick me up while we're waiting for, uh, for the service guys to come? And if you say, I'm sorry, I do not approve of your lifestyle, and you hang up, guess what's going to happen? Within five minutes, you're getting a call from your wife. Who's going to say, who are you? Go get, go get this girl. She's three blocks away. It's pouring. Do not leave her there. And you say, honey, we have had this discussion. I do not approve of their lifestyle. And hang up. What's going to happen five minutes after that? You're going to get a call from your mother being like, I got a call from your wife, who's a lovely woman, and I love her a lot. And she's telling me that her sister's wife is three blocks away and in trouble and distress, and you're not helping her out? Well, Mom, I, I don't care. 
No son of mine. I did not raise you to be that kind of person. The man I raised would go and help a woman in distress. You are, and you're going to be like, yes, mom. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Yes, mom. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll go do it if you stop yelling at me, ma. Uh Uh-huh. Why? Because you have obligations to your mom. You have obligations to your wife. Thus, you have obligations to the people you are connected to. And then there's the kids. You'll have kids. Your brothers and sisters-in-law will have kids. Your brothers and sisters will have kids. Do you have responsibilities to all of these kids? Yes. Do the grandparents have responsibilities to all of these kids? Yes. Do the kids have responsibilities to the grandparents? Yes. Do the kids have responsibilities to the aunts and the uncles? Yes. If you've ever gotten a whooping from an auntie, you know this. And the auntie's like, I know, I don't want to do this, but you, I gotta, I have to do my job. And their job is to make sure you don't do something so stupid you get dead in their presence. Because if you do, then they're responsible. Because nobody is going to come in. Your parents are not coming in and being like, what happened? Oh, well, your son is dead. <gasps> what? Why? Well, he was about to do something stupid. And I said, well, if you, I would give you a whooping and stop you from doing this, but you're not my child. So I just let him do it. They would say, are you insane? You give the kid a whooping and you stop them from doing the thing that's going to kill him. Well, I didn't know where I was at the, I didn't know what the rules were. No, it's. You come in and you go, Mom, Auntie gave me a whooping. And be like, well, what did you do that was so wrong that she gave you a whooping? Well, I was about to kill, get myself killed. And be like, well, she should have given you a whooping. You give you a whooping every time you're about to do something that stupid. Why? Because you have obligations to these kids. And they have obligations to you. And so, everybody in the family has obligations to each other. Simply because of who they are. So you, one day, if you haven't had this moment happen already, you will one day have the weird moment where you will be a parent and a son at the same time. So you will be standing there with your child in your arm and your parent will tell you how to raise that child. And you'll be like, but mom, I am the parent. I can do this. And they'll be like, well, you should listen to me because I'm your parent. And you will be simultaneously two very different things. You are simultaneously a parent and a child, which gives you responsibilities and obligations of a child to a parent, but also as a parent to a child. And you'll have that fight. You'll be like, don't tell me when to put this child to bed. I know what I'm doing. I'm this boy's parent. I gave birth to him. I know what I'm doing. And the old aunties in the family will be like, oh, there she goes again. Oh, there she goes. Thinking they know what they're doing. Mm Mm-hmm. Kids. Kids in there. They're the parents now. But all of this is based on your position. Now, what Confucius then does is expand this. If you take two people together and combine them, you get a family. You combine families, you get a village. You combine villages, you get a city. You combine cities, you get a province. You combine provinces, you get China. You get the empire. You get China. And the idea is that everybody has obligations to everybody else. The emperor has obligations to me, the poor little farmer. What are those obligations? To protect me. To make sure my life goes well. To help me if I get hurt. Do I have responsibilities to the emperor? Yes. Pay taxes, follow the law, and if needed be, go defend the empire. Do I have responsibilities to the, to the other people in the town? Yes. If I'm a, if I'm, if I grow all the apples, I have to make sure that the apples are there in market so that people who don't have apples can buy them. The shoemaker has to show up for work because people need shoes. The horseshoe maker has to show up and make horseshoes. For people who need, whose horses need shoes. If they don't do their job, if they don't follow the rules of obligation, then the entire system breaks down. If everyone says, I don't need you, I can do whatever I want. Well, it doesn't work that way. Everybody is codependent on everybody else. And so what Confucius is doing is showing 
without adding anything. This is the brilliance of Confucianism. He doesn't invent anything. He doesn't create anything. He just says, this is what you're already doing. Do you listen to your parents? And everyone would say, yeah. And so the kid who says, I don't listen to my mom, everyone turns and goes, well, you're a bad son. You're a terrible son. Do you protect your children? Do you help clothe them and feed them? Everyone will say yes, except for that one person who says, no, I let them fend for themselves. Find your own food. Everyone will turn to that person and go, you're a terrible parent. We got to take your kids away from you. You're awful. And so what your position is, whether you're emperor or a shoe salesman or a farmer or a dad or a son or a wife or a mother or a cousin or an auntie or an uncle, all those jobs, all those positions bring with them responsibilities and obligations, things you have to do. Now, here's the thing. Confucianism is never very popular because it's not sexy. Buddhism is sexy. Buddhism is like, we're going to help you find happiness by minimizing the bad things that happen to you. And you're like, whoa, that's pretty cool. Oh, the Eightfold Path is finding your own way to happiness. Like, you go, yeah. Hell, today, mindfulness. If you have done anything in psychology in the last 10 years, it's all mindfulness, mindfulness. Mi mindfulness is just retro simplify Buddhism. That's where it takes its its stuff from. And mindfulness gets you coloring books. Confucianism gets you obligations. It gets you on the roof, in the rain, in your bunny slippers, trying to fix a leak that you have no idea where it's coming from. It has you bailing out your good-for-nothing brother-in-law at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Confucianism is about responsibilities. It is not sexy. It is not... It's not popular. Elites will ha take it. Chinese elites will use it because Chinese elites like this idea because it, it justifies their position. Their position is we will help you do your stuff. Leave, let us be, be in charge. We are, we are a part of the system of regulating, um, success. So elites will pick up Confucianism, but it's never very popular at the, at the, at the local level because it's simply not sexy. Whereas Buddhism is. So, that's where we'll leave off. That's our Confucianism. So we have our values and our, and our how it works. Uh, in our next lecture, we're going to do politics. We're going to do the Chin and the Han. So, thank you very much. <laughs>